Hey you guys, what's going on? Thanks for hanging out again. Today's awesome. You're gonna see five completely different builds from five people who hit the road for adventure for their own darn reasons. This is my top five do-it-yourself builds of Overland Expo. Peter Sulik and I am from Alexandria, Virginia. It is a 1984 Toyota Land Cruiser FJ60. Uh, I purchased it uh, five or six years ago, I think about 2013. I mean, I like that it's old, right? I like that it is, you know, vintage-ish vehicle. It's also simple, easy to work on. I like its reliability, and I like that it's modular. The way that I've built it, it can be, you know, all of the parts can be removed and it can be taken back to stock in a couple of hours, you know, with a couple of wrenches. So. People have asked, what are your game changer items that you that have changed the way that you, you sort of car camp or overland? Um, and for me, it was the fridge. I had used coolers before that and going to a fridge, uh, which first I went to a pretty small ARV fridge and then I went to a bigger Dometic fridge. That really changed, changed the game. Downside of that, of course, is you have to do a lot of electrical work to prep the vehicle, carry the fridge. So, um, you know, it's more than just going out and buying a fridge. You have to prep it and do it right. Uh, the most memorable thing actually happened last weekend. I took uh, my two girls and my wife and we went camping to a campsite that we've gone to before. Uh, and on our way out of the campsite along a forest service road, a big tree fell down across the road and the whole fam got out and contributed and we winched the tree off of the road using our you know appropriate recovery gear and a snatch block and all kinds of things. And, the kids got into it and my wife was controlling the winch and it was a fun little family adventure. My name is George Bull and I'm from Effingham, New Hampshire. Okay, this is a 1990 Mercedes-Benz Unimog U1300L. This was originally an ambulance. Um, I kind of repurposed it into a camper. So it's pretty basic, it's pretty stock. I haven't done any off-road modifications to it. And I basically made an overland vehicle in a weekend with it. I got into Unimogs when I was overlanding in a Land Rover. I was doing a Trans Africa and I realized I needed something just a little bigger, a little more capable. And that's what got me into Unimogs. The biggest challenge with overlanding with a Unimog is the size and size is always a challenge for everybody so when you've got kind of a small vehicle you're always wishing you had a bigger vehicle when you've got a big vehicle you're wishing you had a smaller vehicle so you've got to take into account if you're going to really get off the beaten path and go down jeep trails and stuff like that sometimes i got to really kind of squeeze through with one of the unimogs that i had i was in uh, botswana and it was shaking and when my wife and i looked out there was an elephant scratching its back on the truck and just shaking the whole truck. And that's how we kind of woke up and his eye was like right in looking in to see what was going on and the nose was, was kind of hanging around. So that was, that was pretty memorable. The thing about a Unimog and, and this vehicle, which makes it really nice as an Overland vehicle, is that it definitely, you know, it, everything flexes, everything moves. It really works with the terrain. It really, um, it doesn't fight things and it actually also kind of makes it comfortable on road. It's a little bit of a slow vehicle when you're on road. Once you get off road, it's actually one of the fastest vehicles you can use. I've got a website, unimogcenter.com, has a lot of information on these vehicles. So if you're interested in just learning more about Unimogs, there's all kind of information. It's a good jumping off point. My name is uh, Mike Ladden. I am from, originally I'm from Connecticut. I grew up on the East Coast of the United States. So my truck is a uh, 1979 Mercedes Unimog. It's a 416, also known as a U1100. It's kind of a rare addition because it's a, uh, a Doka, which just means in Germany it's a four door. I call it sort of like an awkward elephant. When you're traveling on off the beaten track, it kind of, it kind of stumbles around like an awkward elephant. The story behind the Unimog is I'm a Land Rover guy and I had a Land Rover Forward Control 101 and I wanted to do an around the world trip. It was gas, it's V8, and I really wanted diesel. So that's the reason that I went to the Unimog. 
essentially can go just about anywhere. I have very, very little problems with it. It's overbuilt, it's a, it's a very rugged truck, and it's very reliable. The trailer that I custom designed and built is kind of the tool to get out there. My goal behind the trailer was to be able to sleep in it comfortably, stand up in it, hot shower, be able to store comfortably my, my, my clothing and everything else that I carry with me, and not have any setup when I roll in and out of camp. And the Unimog is the perfect vehicle to pull that. It gets a lot of attention. I take it as a good thing. I get to meet a lot of people out in the field. And that's, after all, that's what it's about. It's getting out, seeing things, and meeting people. We have a YouTube channel, Instagram, Twitter. Follow us, it's at Drive the Globe. And our website is obviously uh, drivetheglobe.com. My name is Robert Lahr. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma originally. I currently live in Pensacola, Florida. This is a 1964 Ford F-350 with the open road Robinette coach on it, original 1964 with the truck. And I bought it about three years ago. I saw it on Craigslist and it's something that just spoke to me. And I had to have it. Living in Oklahoma at the time, I ended up flying out to Tucson, Arizona, driving an hour from there, sight unseen, purchased this thing and drove it back, uh, not knowing if it'd make it back to Oklahoma. Nobody else is driving one, so when I show up somewhere, I'm the only one with it. Yeah, it's different. I've been traveling in the rig for about two years now. My wife and I and the cat. The most memorable thing that's probably happened was uh, on a camping trip. I uh, had failure of the uh, lugs, actually, and I lost both the driver's side, rear, dual wheels. Both of them came off going down the highway, so that was uh, extensive repair and uh, time off for the rigs. So. At Robert G underscore Lara. It's my name is Oliver Solero and my alter ego is Broken Toots. I'm from a little town in the middle of nowhere, about two and a half hours north of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. What you're looking at here is a bit of unobtainium. Uh, I think there might actually be only one other of this motorcycle in the United States. It is a CCM GP450. And what I've done is I've taken a KTM 450 snow bike track kit and turned a kitchen table upside down, cut the original subframe off of this and welded up the table legs to it so that I could graft it onto the CCM. Because in 2016, there was a rather major rail line flood in northern Manitoba. Rumor had it that because they were unable to provide food for some of the mushing dogs up there, there were some dark stories floating around of some of the mushers having to have to put their dogs down. So I built this unit here so that I could haul a thousand pounds worth of donated dog food up there. And as a result, they gave me a little pup who is three quarter husky, a quarter greyhound, and a hundred percent full but he's worth every minute of it. <laughs> I spent a good solid month out on the Arctic tundra hauling dog food back and forth uh, along that abandoned rail line, or I should say that flooded rail line. Um, and there was a moment at the end where in, in Northern Manitoba, the Northern lights are off the charts. The Aurora Borealis are, the, the, you don't see them anywhere else on the planet like that. The two of us sat there at three o'clock in the morning and just spent four hours just staring at the sky, mesmerized by the electricity that was going on above us. Uh, back in 2015, I took a shot at taking this bike up onto the world's longest ice road, which is the Wapusk Trail on the southern edge of western Hudson's Bay. At the time, the part of the, uh, the, the world where it's situated was in the grips of the polar vortex, so I saw sustained temperatures of minus 40 to actually minus 50 at night. And with this little disposable beast of a motorcycle that I picked up for 1200 bucks, I managed to uh, pull off what I think might actually be a Guinness record attempt at making the entire length of the Wapus Trail. The only modifications we've done to this is put a dual battery setup, a snowmobile primer, and drill a hole in the air box for a shot of ether, and that's it. And with that setup and a sterno can lid under the motor, I can reliably fire this thing up at minus 40 degrees. Uh, I'm, I'm just a blue collar grunt mechanic making 19 bucks an hour in, in Ontario, Canada, and I scratched together a little bit of uh, money here and there to take these trips. But that being said, if you've got a coffee in your hand and you're bored out of your skull, just Google broken tooth ice road biker and it, you'll find something on some of the, the nutty stuff that I've done in the Arctic.